Um, all right, well, thank you all for being here this morning. Um, when we planned this conference, we got a diversity of opinion about things they wanted to hear. That a lot of our research program is driven by the growers. It comes from you all asking us to do things. And so we made this one session for me just a glue together of things, of multiple disparate things that people wanted to hear. Uh, an update from on where our, our progress had been. Um, you'll find in your red folders there that uh, uh, you have both a, a one-sheet handout that summarizes the corn and the soybean variety trials from, 20, uh, from 2011. And I want to just go through those with you and interpret them on your own. Uh, I think they're pretty self-explanatory in a lot of cases. Um, but give you a background, you know, the, again, it's kind of like the wheat if you were at my wheat lecture the other day. Our big question is, we have an official variety trial that does a spectacular job in the conventional system. Does their results match what we expect for organic growers, or do we see that system sorting out for different varieties? In wheat, we've got some very interesting changes in ranks there. Um, also, we have a special problem with soybeans and uh, with corn, is that we don't have a lot of the varieties in the official variety trials are Roundup Ready. Uh, we have BT and everything, and you know, uh, there was concern a couple of years ago, are we running out of varieties for the organic sector? I mean, there are certainly not that many releases anymore without the genes in there. And so we're trying to give you a little update on how much genetics do we have access to at this point. Um, so soybeans, how do, we, uh, how do we run that test? We've got a couple of uh, sites that we kept for soybeans this year. We plant everything at three locations. Uh, we lose stuff from time to time. We've got a couple that uh, we, we took all the way to the harvest for soybeans. And uh, here's our general uh, practices that we're conducting on those. I don't believe we put manganese sulfate at Goldsboro. We didn't need that. Uh, Kinston site regularly, uh, regularly needs some manganese for that location. Um, and uh, I mean, we're doing this all with chicken litter. At Kinston, we're doing it. I have that on there with uh, pelleted chicken litter and uh, with a raw chicken litter at Goldsboro. Um, our weed management here, we didn't uh, actually, we had a very dry summer, so we didn't, with corn and soybeans, we didn't rotary hoe as intensively as we normally do. We only hit everything a couple of times because our, our weed control, uh, particularly Goldsboro, was excellent. Um, and uh, we did between row cultivate about four times at both locations. Um, all right, so let's review, you know, when I got down here, the situation was changing a little bit. When we got, I got down here, I was actually starting to worry that we were going to run out of fives. Um, we've had some recent releases in the maturity group fives, um, and so we're doing a little better here. Um, in fact, actually now I'm worrying about the sixes and sevens more than I am about the fives. Um, so we've got a number, and we've got a diversity of public breeders that are releasing here. So uh, Osage, we've got coming out of Arkansas that's doing very well. Fowler, uh, that's a little older uh, variety, it's probably 10 years old at this point, uh, coming out, and that's out of Missouri. We've got several things uh, out of Tennessee. Um, so we've got, uh, um, you know, a, a diversity of stuff that's doing pretty well. I'd like to highlight the still one of the most popular varieties is Hutchison, planted on organic farms when we do our surveys. That variety is, that was an 18, 1987 release. And both on our test and the official variety testing at uh, the university, we are seeing that that is really lagging behind now. You are losing some yield potential uh, out of Hutchison versus some of these newer releases out there. I think pretty good consensus. Now, Hutchison did become popular because it is a very even variety, I will say. I can't really, you don't have enough data yet to measure its evenness, but if you ever watch Hutchison during a, um, during a drought conditions, it's able to maintain yield under drought fairly well. It's just what led its popularity for a long time. Um, the five lakes, we've got some uh, new releases coming out. This one here, we're working with the breeder. This is out of uh, uh, NC State University. And uh, um, I, it appears they're not going to do a plant variety protection release at Foundation C. So we're trying to move on getting that release to the organic community. Because you know, right now, there's not a lot of demand for the non-Roundup Ready traits. And so the, the university is getting a little cavalier about what's going on with some of these. Uh, varieties. I like this variety a lot, um, and so we're uh, sort of trying to see if we can get it released to the growers. The breeder is very supportive of that. Um, I've got in here, I want to mention that throughout your handout, I've got in light gray everything that's an experimental line that has not been released yet. But these are experimental lines that could be released. So one of the things they, that we're doing this test for as well is to be able to go back to the breeder and say, okay, you're this advanced line is going quite nicely. Will you let us have the seed then? 
either a plant variety uh, an official release or some other mechanism. And so we see uh, both, there's two public breeding programs in North Carolina. We have NC State's breeding program and USDA ARS has, uh, and their designations here with the N, um, uh, has their own breeding program. And so we've got some nice experimental lines coming out of both of those programs. And this is where I was mentioning here, I mean, the sixes and the sevens in terms of what officially is available on the market right now, we ain't got a lot. Now, fortunately, we have a very good variety. NC Roy uh, is still top of the pack. Uh, it's only like maybe five or six year old variety right now. And it's still a very nice variety. But we have some experimental lines that are coming up too that are doing very well. But we don't have a lot on the market. Again, the same thing with seven. Uh, NC Raleigh uh, is a nice variety. We had some, I mean, this is one year of data, and I would like to emphasize that. And I compare it to the official variety trial on soybeans, and particularly this maturity group, we've got some differences. So we're testing all these varieties again the second year to see if this pans out. We had some experimental lines coming out of NC State and out of uh, the ARS lab here that did extremely well relative to, to NC Raleigh. Uh, I hope that's true, but that was a big difference to have detected and it's only one year, so we'll see if that holds up in a in future year. Actually, overall, I really like NC Raleigh. I don't know if any of y'all have, have planted that out of the maturity group seven, but it's also a very nice variety. Um, I want to just open this, and anybody want to give feedback here about maturity groups, I've been trying to sort of see how folks are thinking about maturity groups in the organic world, because, you know, there's been some migration. When I got down here, we had some black land growers really experimenting uh, with the maturity group threes and fours, which we usually think of as Midwestern maturity groups. Uh, there is a, there's a sparkling of, uh, of uh, conventional land that's planted to threes and fours now on an early production system where they come in and they plant those soybeans in April. And one of the reasons they do it is just hurricane risk avoidance. So they're able to get that stuff out of the field. You know, sometimes I've seen growers pick in their soybeans and then start picking their corn. Um, but some organic growers were interested in that because it would allow them to uh, avoid corn earworm damage almost entirely. You're going to have all your pods set before the corn earworms are going to cause you any trouble, which is a great, uh, great mentality. We have not seen, I don't think anybody is doing that anymore, and the reason was is then your, your soybean crop started to lose all of its leaves in August, the weeds would start growing, and so even if you had good weed control when you set your yields, you had all the yield you needed out there in the field, can't run the combine until the uh, frost comes through and cleans out your weeds. By that point, you've had a, a Midwestern soybean sitting out there in the rain for you know three months, and the seed you know you're, you had a lot of these easy kernels out there or, or seeds out there. So that does not appear to have worked out. Um, now the early fives, which again Hutchison is an early five. Um, I, I, the early fives do seem to avoid quite a bit of corn earworm risk, so it's not as perfect as a three or a four, but we do have, seem to have less corn earworm. Don't have data on that. That's just from talking to growers. We seem to have less uh, corn earworm on that. And that is, is late enough that we haven't seen that weed interaction. We've done okay on the weeds and not releasing them in competition with early fives. Um, that said, you know, I mean, it's very scary to put all your eggs in one basket if you were, it's not like you can all throw just fives out there because, you know, this year was a perfect year to see where uh, five, we lost a lot of yield on fives on conventional land. And you see we lost some quite a bit as well on the organic testing because the drought was right when we needed to be filling pods on the fives. And the six and the sevens, we had some rainfall come in there late. I don't know, they started up in September sometime. We set a lot of yield on the sixes and sevens late in the season. It was already too late in the game for the fives to pan out for us, so it's uh, too risky to do that. Now, in terms of competitive ability, the sixes and the sevens, competitive ability with weeds does seem to be a little bit better. So we also have that advantage as well. I mean, uh, some of that is just, uh, you know, in, we, I don't know how you all do, but oftentimes I'll start planting my fives on time, but by the time I finish up my fives, I'm probably pushing the envelope a little bit. So that bean ends up being a little short. It doesn't quite get as big as I would like it to get. And so that's probably some of the effect we see. Sixes and sevens, I have so much more flexibility. I can plant that on up through late June and still get a nice big, big bean crop out of that. Anybody else have any comments there about what they're seeing on what they're 
uh, maturity group experience has been. All right. Um, corn, we, um, we've got a couple of locations that we kept out of that as well. We planted the tree and, and uh, the drought. This was not the corn year for our webinar audience. This was not the year to have uh, corn in most counties in North Carolina. We had some black land sites that did relatively well, um, uh, some farmers, but the coastal plain, uh, this was a terrible year for corn. Um, <clears throat> here's our general production practices, if you're interested in those. And uh, I'm combining over two site years. Uh, we didn't have a big interaction amongst the two sites, so the, 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 the average yield was a lot higher at one site than the other. Um, we have some marketing going on of the very early maturing uh, corns for us, and um, we only had uh, a few in the test here this year, particularly with the drought timing, but they're not well adapted to here. I mean, this is not our maturity group. Uh, get into maturity groups, we generally we're planting over 114 day here for this uh, on the webinar, uh, but here's our meeting maturities, uh, looking at some of the players. Um, Corn is a different beast than the wheat and the soybeans. We do not have a ton of varietal, I mean, not a lot of selection out there for what we can plant. So when I came down here, we had um, a lot of the big companies were releasing untreated conventional seeds still, and it was much easier to get a wider access of uh, genetics. That has been shut down primarily. So most of that stuff, even if it's available conventionally without the genetic traits, you're not going to get your hands on it anymore uh, untreated. I actually called Pioneer because I had when I first year down here, I had a Pioneer variety that I really loved to, to do my research plots with, and I couldn't get it the second year. I said, well, just leave some off the line for me. They'll send it through. They said, look, if you're not going to purchase like 90,000 units, or if I can't ship 90,000 units to your state of this untreated product, you're not getting it. And so that's just, so we, yeah. Uh, thank goodness we have a few companies that are out there working on this issue for us right now. Um, so let's get into our, our typical maturity rating. And again, these aren't great yields, although at the one site we were up, you know, 120 plus bushels. And so um, if, we had, if we had the moisture, we had good varieties out there. Uh, this is a new line out of Blue River. Uh, I believe it doesn't come out of their breeding program, but it's a, a, line, a license that they've got for a variety uh, that really is looking good. Now this is organically available seed as well. We have some other lines we put in here that we can still ride the untreated conventional seed, and the Augusta lines are that. Um, like I said that they're you know getting few and far between of the number of those that we can still access. Um, and then we've got uh, Doblers coming into this, and my understanding is Doblers is actually purchasing. Well, seed industry has gotten complicated lately. Uh, they're owned by Pioneer, which is owned by somebody else, and so they're actually uh, taking it. They've got an organic seed section of Doblers now that is marketing Pioneer hybrids, which may be available even on Roundup Ready, but we don't have the pedigrees on that. But at times, I suspect, when you look at them in the field, that corn variety is actually something we see in the Roundup Ready world, but it's hard to, it's hard to verify that for sure. Um, so anyway, we've got uh, some new players in there, which is very exciting to see since we have so few players in the seed market. Yep. Yeah, well, he's in Virginia, but he, put, he pulls a lot of seed down here. I mean, he delivers uh, Charlie Mill, Mill Iron out of Virginia, covers our area, you may know. And Luke was here. Is Luke from Blue River? I saw him earlier. Um, so Blue River is well covered here. Um, we get the Ag Venture, I want to say that comes out of um, Sweetwater Seeds is where that was purchased by George, I believe. Williamson. Uh, Williamson, yeah. Hardison. Yeah, Cliff Hardison, I'm sorry. Yeah. So these are all things that we can get here that are very easy for us to... And this Blue River, this was a... I remember I said I highlighted in gray everything that was an experimental line that wasn't yet available. But I just talked to Luke today, and apparently they, that seed was available this year. He had, he's just run out of it. So, um, I've got a bunch of questions. Is there anybody here from a seed company right now? I'll be less guarded about what I say here now because <laughs> um, I've been asked a question about saving seed. Uh, 
So I want to answer that. Um, soybean and wheat seed, you know, those are, those are things that we can save seed for. And in terms of genetics, when we plant it, we get back out of the field the same genetics that we put into that field. So if a farmer wants to do farmer save seed, I mean, we have the quality considerations. One of the things that certified seed buys us is we've got people out there really scouting to make sure that we don't have disease issues, that we don't have weed infestation issues or whatever, and that we have a very clean product that is very germinable, it's going to get germination tested, it's going to get all those things. So certification of seed buys us a lot. Um, but I've been asked the question, if I plant back what I have out there, does it, is it the same product? And it is. So if I plant NC Roy, I save my NC Roy and I plant it back, I've got NC Roy and I'm certain of that. Okay? As long as I segregate that from any other varieties I have out there. Corn hybrids, of course, but that's the very different thing. And please forgive me, I hope there's nobody from the genetics department that's going to look at my slide presentation here. But <laughs> when I took plant breeding, I could not track their F1, F3, and this synthetic. So it's mom, it's dad, it's grandpa, that's the only thing I keep in my head. Um, <clears throat> corn hybrids, we do have, oh, have a breeder here, Mike. Just, for, just, just cover your ears right now, all right? Um, <clears throat> You know, that, that's a situation where we have a field of identical moms that are getting crossed to a, a line of identical dads. And so that when we plant that F1 hybrid out there, those are all genetically identical. But the breeders like to call them heterozygous. They had a different mom and a different dad. And the mom and dad might be quite different. Sometimes, in some cases, shockingly different. So if we save the seed off of these the children are all genetically identical, but their children will not be. So there's where the saving seed creates that erratic. If you've ever tried it on your farm, you lose uniformity. It does depend on which F1 hybrid you've got, though. Some F1 hybrids, if you save the seed on them, will be a heck of a lot more uniform than others. And so it's not outrageous to suggest if you're interested in this approach. And that's where I'm going. I'm not arguing that it's a good idea or a bad idea. Some people are trying it. If you want to do it, you might want to try it with a variety of hybrids. Some will save much more than others is what I should say. The uniformity would be uh, very different between some of the hybrids. There's another more abstract argument that uh, some people have made in that having complete uniformity of all genetic traits is the biggest advantage is when you have an ideal growing environment. So if we think about the Midwest where corn is just such a beautiful fit, that's a great environment to have completely uniform genetics. We have a, a much more erratic corn production cycle here. I mean, in some years, you would, have, you would rather have a little different maturity or a little different this or a little different that. And some lack of uniformity is actually could be a way of hedging your bets a little bit. So that uh, you, in, a, in a bad year, you may do pretty well with a saved hybrid, some saved hybrids. Yep. Wouldn't the, the same genetics also be a greater risk? Yes. Right. Now, one of the things that um, uh, corn hybrids that, particularly the ones that are coming here out of the Southeast breeding programs, which uh, are very heavily selected against all diseases. In fact, you know, like the NC State hybrids that we had on that test there, you know, they actually purposely infect like 10 diseases, all of that. And so you're getting pretty broad resistance to a lot of diseases. But it's good to look at the resistance rating across all of your all of your diseases that you might have out there. Now, one discouraging thing: this is something organic we hope to solve here. Uh, we don't have disease ratings right here um, uh, in the slide presentation, but um, in the conventional sector, some of that breeding is not taking place here anymore. So, what they'll do is they'll actually develop the corn hybrids in midwestern conditions, and then or you know other parts of uh, you know, Arkansas, those places, and they'll come and test under our conditions for a few years. If the yield's okay, then they'll release, then they'll sell it here. But diseases are kind of cyclical, you know, and so all of a sudden we'll have a disease outbreak that it hasn't, there's a couple of years of testing that didn't cover, and so uh, conventions have fallen apart occasionally. Just a, a word of caution, I want to find saving seed. Uh, yep. Of things, it's 
For the webinar, I was going to catch you that. So I'm making a very important point here. On, on legal issues, saving seed on soybean and wheat on a, on a non, with no genetic engineer traits in there, you can only save it and grow it on your own farm. The second you sell it, you've broken the law. So that's the way that works. And, and, and corn hybrids are the same. So, I mean, if you were to save a non-engineered trait, you can only grow it on your own farm. Um, so the other question I've answered just from a folk, couple of folks is the open pollinated, where we have a very different situation there. So we have less uniformity. The biggest problem that we have, though, is that these have not been bred for a uh, hundred years, basically. And so their yields, we just don't have any. We don't have genetics in the open pollinated realm anywhere near what we have in hybrid corn. Now, part of there, there is some hybrid advantage inherently, but there's also just ignored and being completely ignored by the breeding community. Don't have these that have been that have been developed. Um, uh, double hybrids is something that I believe will be coming uh, from, from the organic seed industry. Now they have been abandoned in the conventional seed industry since the 70s. So we went to single cross hybrids. It is a pain in the neck for the organic seed industry to do uh, have single cross hybrids for us, though, because the inbreds they're using to make that seed are sorry looking things. They don't compete with weeds well, and so it's a pain. So I, I, I think we have several public breeding groups that have been working on this issue of creating double hybrids again and, and bringing, all you basically got to do is go back to the lines in the 70s that they were using sort of, you know, bring up to, uh, uh, bring up to speed uh, some of the, the patterns that they felt that were good for, for hybrids, double hybrids at the time. Um, oh, and I will mention I just noticed my slide was missing in there. I wanted to mention one other product that you're, that, that you're going to hear about probably from Blue River, and that's the Pure Amaze. So uh, Blue River is going to have, I believe, this coming year, seed available that will uh, has very low rates of crossing with GMOs. And they've got a little video posted on their website right now where they have taken blue corn pollen and they dump it, and they take a bag and they dump it on the silks uh, of, a, of a yellow variety. And they close it up so they don't leave any more pollen in there. And they try to show you how much, uh, uh, how much blue seed, blue pollen actually got in there and successfully fertilized that yellow variety. And out of a whole corn kernel, they'll get two or three blues on there. And that's from dumping the seed. So it's pretty significant crossing barrier. So if you imagine now I've got to get pollen that's blowing in from somewhere else, and it's got to compete with the yellow corn pollen, the level of outcrossing from those pure maize lines is going to be really low. Um, we have been working with the system at NC State as well. Major Goodman, the corn breeder there, has been working with that. We haven't found a, 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 a heterotic pattern, to, but we haven't found a genetic pattern to get the great yielder that we would like out of that system yet. Um, but So we're, we're excited to see what Blue River has for us, and we're, we're going to be testing that in the coming year. We're going to be testing several different crossing barrier lines to see how the yields are looking out of those. So anyway, it is here now. Any questions about that one? I don't know how many people are being tested. Braswell here is not testing. I don't think any of our, our, our processors are testing yet, except for uh, if anybody shipped anything to the tortilla chip maker in the uh, foothills up in Lincolnton, they're running GMO testing now. And so I think you have to be under 1% uh, contaminated by, uh, by traits to be able to sell to them. So I haven't heard about this. I don't think our farmers face a serious contamination. It's, it's one of those things in other parts of the country, it's a serious issue and they are getting turned down. So any processor that's testing, and that's mainly, you know, the animal feed sector, I haven't heard of anybody testing yet. So we're growing mainly for animal feed. But the folks who are growing for human food grade, uh, most of the, like, the Haynes Celestials, the big chip makers, everybody selling at the Whole Foods, the organic products, the Whole Foods, and, you know, even our Target nowadays, 
that product line is all being tested. They banded together, and I think their current cutoff now, this is not a government thing, this is just the processors wanting to have, you know, a, a, be able to make a marketing claim. They want to be 1% or under on GMO uh, contamination. So if you're going to grow for the human food grade market in corn, you're going to be facing this at some point. Now, in terms of the only other thing here is we have to assure our certifiers that we're doing something to avoid some contamination. It's more of a, it's a paper process thing. You know, they ask you, what are you doing about that? And I, th I think our growers are generally saying we're planting later, which they are. And so we're avoiding a lot of contamination by different flowering times in the corn. Uh, but this would be another way to do it. Well, there is nothing spelled out in the code, and so you know you, you're going to have to negotiate that with your certifier, probably. Yeah, I want to say it's 700 feet. So is is the is the standard for production of corn seed is what they use to to keep it clean. Is that right? Oh, you guys don't mind if I do updates for a while, do you? Um, I think we're about out of time. I've got 10 minutes here, so let me just run a couple things. Uh, so canola, I wanted to just give you a little update on where we're at with the canola project. So first of all, my simple people ask, keep asking me, does it grow here? Is it well adapted here? My answer is yes. I mean, we've been growing it for a couple of years now, but also we have the Organic Canola Variety Testing Program that's been running for several years at NC State. Our yield numbers here out of North Carolina look very nice relative to other places they produce canola. So we do not have an inherent biological problem with production of canola here in North Carolina. I think we feel very comfortable with being able to say that. Um, what we have lacked historically is why is there no canola here? Today? It's really been a marketing issue as far as I can tell. We just have not had the buyers here interested in canola. Uh, on the organic end of things, we now have that with AgStrong uh, out of northeast Georgia there. So uh, we've got a couple of growers that are, are growing canola for them. And they're actually buying conventional canola as well. So we have conventional and organic canola being produced for that outfit. Uh, on the conventional side, we also have a few thousand acres of canola as well that's being used uh, for, I guess that's mainly going into a biodiesel plant up, in, up near Statesville. So. Um, our economics, I imagine, were very different for the organic canola. I mean, we're not making biodiesel out of this stuff. This is going into high-end cooking oil and into animal feed. Um, so, um, but once a couple of things, if you're interested in trying this out uh, with AgStrong, uh, they have a wellspring of information, and, and we've got a couple of gentlemen here today I do encourage you to introduce yourself to uh, and, and talk to them about it. And they've been trying to teach me about canola production as much as they possibly can stuff into my head. Um, the biggest thing I would say that you, that you need to be aware of is that our harvest window is very short. Ours has been coming in about a week ahead of time of wheat, which has been handy for my cropping rotation research and probably be handy for your farm operations as well. But our harvest windows have been very short. So, you know, you can go out there one day and say, ah, I'm just not quite ready to run that combine yet. And four days later, you're like, oh my god, I've got to combine now or I'm going to lose the crop. So it's a very short harvest window. Yeah, okay, I'll uh, repeat the question. So we had a question about uh, if we're going to shatter some seed, do we have a weed that we're going to be very concerned about in our next crop? Canola. Uh, canola, right. I mean, yeah, canola as a weed is going to be developed in our next crop. Uh, my re you know, we have not been following our plots with, uh, with soybeans, which is where it's going to fit in the rotation. I mean, canola is going to be double crop with soybeans if we're going to grow it here. Does not like, this is some, not something that likes the heat. We're going to be cultivating those soybeans as well. And so I don't think it's actually going to be all that big of an issue for us, but that is just a guess and a prediction. And so, you know, we're going to be finding that out when we're growing it on farm here. Um, it, it, they do worry about a little bit with the conventional canola here. They've got Roundup Ready soybeans that are being drilled in right after that canola is coming off the ground. 
and the canola, you know, is Roundup Ready as well that they're planting. And so now, you know, what is our, we, do we need to change our herbicide program? Well, how much are we going to lose from having this, you know, winter crop trying to grow in the summer? And so I don't know the answer to that for them. But for us, I suspect it's going to be not much of an issue. Oh, yeah. We do not. You know, there are obviously Monsanto and others who would like to bring in uh, Roundup Ready for, but and it's not that we're, you know, we're not anti technology. We just don't want a winter broadleaf crop becoming a wheat. You know, we use enough Roundup now on soil that we don't need another Roundup you know, Ready crop. And, I, and, and, and obviously, I mean, this crowd knows that. That those would not be allowed in organic production. So we're talking here about the variety of work we're doing is all conventional, no genetic, no engineered traits. Yeah, I would say that we're, we've got two, two growers now that are off to a good start. Uh, and no one uh, has a winter crop is probably an ideal for organic production because of the robust growth that you get. You know, I mean, whether, whether you want to cultivate 30 inch rows, it's probably better to go to And our work so far on canola has really been focused around whether we're going to have a, a weed control issue uh, right off the bat. We have done drill work so far. Uh, and there, we are got some different growth spacings this year for the first time. We've been drilling in about seven inches so far. Um, now, it is slow to take off in the fall. Um, doesn't become a very robust plant until later in the spring most years. This year it's actually a little extra robust. It's really looking pretty darn big right now. Um, so it can look at first, it can look like, oh, I'm not sure about this hindbit situation, but we haven't seen any problems with, with it later on. I mean, it becomes this in a hurry, and, you're, and you don't worry about the hindbit, you don't worry about the chickweed. We, uh, the, the only issue now that we're trying to test out is what's the ryegrass situation going to be like. And so we've got row spacings out there testing now, and whether it makes sense to run a cultivator, should I space it out wide enough? You can grow. Canola is a, a weird beast. It's not like wheat. I mean, wheat can grow it, and it has been grown around the world everywhere from 17, I mean, from 7 inches to 30 inches. And so you have a lot of flex there because it, it's even more robust than a soybean plant in terms of it is, has a gap. It just expands and expands and expands. And you can make a huge shrub out of it if you have a wide enough spacing. Um, so we're trying to figure out what's the optimal for the ryegrass situation, but not a lot of worry about the henbit or the chickweed or those other things at this point would be my summation. Um, the um, the roast bait, well, I mentioned the roast bait since I mentioned that. One of the issues uh, we're talking about is that a lot of conventional production, they've been pushing these very low seeding rates, you know, down like three pounds of seed per acre. That is, make, makes me more worried about the weed control situation. So what's the downside? Just one headed organics, we're used to pushing more seed at the weed situation wherever we can. Uh, we just want to make sure we don't create a disease issue because you get a very thick canopy earlier on with the higher seeding rates. We have less airflow through the canopy. We want to make sure that we're not creating any disease situations like that. And that can be affected by row spacing as well. I mean, maybe what we want to do is push the seeding rate in row, give it a little more air to breathe in between. I mean, that's just the very simple questions that we can answer with this. Yeah, so what is your row spacing, growing, and sclerotinia problem? We have the first year of the row spacing. Are you asking about the row spacing and sclerotinia issue? Uh, this is the first year that we have multiple row spacings, so that's what the, the very key thing that we're, uh, we're hoping to answer. And we're getting ready to run steel through the field on our wide row spacing for the first time as soon as we finish cutting that cultivator size. So. Um, so this could be um, a successive rotation from the week to week if the year off, so you know, one year. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the thing that I envision how it might fit into the rotation here is that we stop full season soybeans. <laughs> I mean, you, a grower could say, uh, I am, I'm going to grow double crop with soybeans every time I grow soybeans. And so every other time I'm going to do uh, uh, 
canola, and then I'll grow the wheat the next time back and forth. Because I wouldn't want to, you know, uh, grow wheat in an organic rotation too often. Probably every third or fourth year is what, about as often as I want it in there if I can, if I have that flexibility in my cropping rotation. And so we could put this in at the other time. And the reason I say that is because soybeans, while being a can be a very profitable crop. It has proven to be our riskiest crop. We have weed control situations that get out of hand in soybeans almost half the time at this time it seems. So double cropping helps reduce your risk because you've got a crop coming out that I'm making money off of before I even put the soybeans in the field. Plus, it appears that our double crop soybeans are less weedy in general than our full season crop soybeans. So we are it pretty uniformly seen that to be the case. And I think it's just a matter of we're planting so late in the season, and that's not getting planted until mid-June, late June, uh, we, we are losing some of the weed flushes that are occurring there in May. And I don't know if that's been anybody else's experience, but I've spotted it on my plots several times now. Okay, so let me give a little background on that. We do need to be more cognizant of our planting on canola than we do on small grains. I mean, you know, we always say that we want you to plant the small grains, you know, last week of October, early November, but people are still planting in December. You are asking for death and destruction if you have this kind of attitude with canola because uh, you could absolutely, if we don't make the basil rosette stage of a canola crop before we get a very hard freeze, you could have complete destruction of the whole field. So we want to plant it, for everywhere here east of 95, I would say we want to plant it by mid-October. We start planting our plots like first week of October, we could probably back it up. I don't want to back up too far, but I could probably back it up into the third week of September, try to plant by October 15. Now, if we have a warm fall, it's not to say, I, this is what I worry about is that some people are going to have the experience that I had. I had to go and replant one year at one site where I got a flood. I mean, it actually went all the way under water for a few days. So I went back and replanted uh, first week in November <laughs> just to see what would happen. We had a warm time, which was last season. I have a great yield, great stand out of that, but I couldn't have been lost in everything. So, would that, did I say misspeak here from the, your experience in Georgia? Practice, practice is often always critical. You can be pretty flexible on your feet, but you can say, find your options. I will mention just one other thing that I find quirky is it the, the canola, as I'm seeing, it becomes winter hardy. Uh, it, it does it differently than small grains. And so if it goes from really warm to really cold quickly, we'll burn the leaves. We've seen frost damage at even like 27, 28 degrees where it gets you know, out, out blistered for some frost. They recover from that. As long as you've made basil rosette, that doesn't matter a thing in the world as far as I can tell. Three weeks later, you can't even tell anything that ever happened there. Uh, we're also seeing this year it'll purple up with a real big cold snap, and it looks like, oh my god, but we don't think that's any issue either based on other states. So. Yeah, you're going to pull it out about a week before your wheat crop, so you know, first week of June, most likely. We've harvested a little bit in late May. I want to say this last year, we harvested May 28th all of our plots. Um, one last thing I'll notice that we, we're, we're waiting to confirm on is that, uh, so we've, we've gotten up to, you know, nine pounds of seed. We've gone all the way up to 15 on our roast basin work, but, I mean, this is a crazy amount of seed. You want to go past what's reasonable when you do research, you know. Uh, but, you know, nine so far hasn't caused us the disease problems. That's what we want to continue to verify. We may be triple the rate sometimes that they recommend and, and for conventional. Uh, we haven't seen the issues yet, but again, that's one of the things we're really scouting for. But one interaction we have noticed is that uh, a little higher seeding rate is causing greater uniformity. So this crop is, uh, uh, I mentioned it goes from uh, not harvestable to too harvestable in a hurry, but it's still green when you're out there. If you're not, you know, we don't have access to a desiccant. You've still got a lot of green material out there, and that's what you've got to get used to uh, adapting your eyes to. And, and you're going to, well, we set the combine head very high, 
and we don't, we're not processing it. It's okay on the combine. And actually, I don't even have to have my concave very close. I actually leave it more open than a wheat crop. It threshes very easily. Um, but uh, uh, that's a zippy. That's a zippy cell phone number. Um, <laughs> Uh, but the, the uniformity gets better and our moisture levels drop more when we have a little higher seeding rates. You can actually look at our moistures here uh, at nine pounds. And uh, we think that's because when you have, it has a lot of space, it'll send out the secondary branches that are a little later, and then they'll be greener when I come through with the combine. And by we crowd it a little bit, then we get this nice, uniform, more uniform seed development that browns down a little more even. So. That was seven, seven oh, inches. Seven. Yeah, those are all drilled. Yeah, the, yeah. Our, our is not, not quite seven and a half. Long story. Um, but uh, the Salisbury site, we actually uh, used some paraquat on that for logistical reasons. We weren't doing organic testing yet. This year, we got the first true organic canola testing. We've got chicken litter on there. We're organic all the way. And that's the other thing I'll mention is just by doing the math for organic growers. We think we're going to be okay on sulfur. We think, you know, sulfur is big. You read the conventional guidelines. It's all, it's all the stuff about making sure it does feed heavily on a lot of sulfur. But if we put the nitrogen, when we're putting about two tons down in the fall, we're putting on another couple tons in the spring, we should be okay on sulfur just by math. But we'll sort of be confirming that along the way as well. That'd be y'all's guess as well. I mean, if we needed to put sulfur on it, if we find that, in fact, litter is not going to be out of balance a little bit, wanted to, you know, I'd probably go in there with some potassium sulfate. Uh, would probably be the cheapest access to it. I mean, here you could do it with gypsum, but we'd probably just go out there with an organically available potassium sulfate. Probably the sulfur and boron. You know, you a lot of cotton growers on boron and all, but the boron mostly tests will show that there is some stem uh, strengthening with the having good but most of the data will show you that in Europe that the boron goes on and plowing the time. That's the big thing. So. And the last thing I'll mention, I'm past five minutes past our time here, um, is um, we, and, and these guys have already agreed with this and it's other states experience primarily, but uh, does not like very deep sand. So if we're on the coastal plain, we want some heavier soils out there. Uh, but it will not tolerate poor drainage as well. So if we're out in the blacklands, we want fields with your best drainage that you're growing your best wheat crops out of, or you're going to have disease issues. Probably agronomic issues, but you're going to have disease issues for sure. All right, any questions? Any other? David, where'd you go? Didn't you have something? You had some weighty issues there that hit me and Julie with. <laughs> And John's back here in the audience too, so if I say something he disagrees with. Oh, the question is about uh, having this cover crop system and what we're doing to de deplete soil moisture with. And you're on the coastal plain down there in South Carolina, aren't you, David? Yeah. So Alabama, uh, uh, Maryland, Georgia are recommending for the cover crop systems where you have a heavy cover crop that you actually roll now and wait for a significant soil recharge. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> John's agreed. So uh, we have tried that with our soybeans now. Uh, now you're still probably starting with a bit of a deficit. I mean, if we think about even a, a, a fairly sandy soil, you're probably holding at least eight inches of water throughout the profile. That next significant rainfall, we could, and then plant after that. We've got enough to get our seeds started, but you know, maybe you're still got a, a deficit of six inches of rain in there. So it does hold risk for the coastal plain to have that. Now here, where we've got uh, we've had the best luck on our uh, red soils and our blackland soils in the system. The blacklands, if anything, drying up soil profile is a big advantage of the system where excess moisture in the spring is, is a much bigger issue than worrying about drought later on. Um, so, but yeah, the coastal plain, I am nervous about that. So, yeah. It may just not fit there. 
in, 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 in some crops may not fit in particular corn, but may just be a terrible idea. Soybeans maybe still, but maybe not even then. For our virtual audience, if you have questions, just type them into the chat box. Your, your uh, cereal rye or a rye grass? Yeah, I mean, and you're wanting to plant like a crop in amongst the rye grass. Oh, you know, I, I, we, I've never, I don't know if anybody's ever tried to roll till an annual rye grass and whether it kills well with that. Uh, it actually would make me a little nervous to see, to see whether that would kill well or not. Now, you also could have a perennial ryegrass in what you have, and that certainly we wouldn't, rolling it would not do a thing to it. You would have to actually till that under. But annual ryegrass is a strange and almost untamed beast in my mind, and I would be worried about whether we could effectively roll till it. So I, I would say till it. Yeah. Yeah. We think in all the small grains. Yeah, all the small grains are very easy to till with a roller. Um, so we want to wait until they're in like the milk or the soft dough stage from the early stages of seed development. And it's very easy to kill at that time. I mean, the, the high-tech rollers are great. Um, and for a bigger operation, they're, they're very inexpensive and they're effective and they're fuel efficient. But, I mean, you can walk down a cover crop that's that far along by one of these small grains and squash it with your feet. So it's, we, can be, you know, we, we can be very open-minded about how we're going to kill that crop with by rolling it down. Yeah. Your last year, uh, you talked about soybeans and roll kill. Yeah. You said that problem with the lot. Yeah. Had the same problem this year. At one site we did. So the question is, in the no-till soybean system, are we still having a lodging problem? And why haven't I figured out what the darn problem is yet? Um, I, I still have not figured out exactly what's generating it, that, that lodging issue that we have. We ha are still having it most of the time. And the funny thing about the lodging that's occurring in the, in the rye is that it's efficiently late that we're getting full yield. So it's not lodging so early that we're, lo we're losing any yield out of the system. So the only thing we've been experiencing from it is that we're having a slower combine time through the field. That is the, the only you know, our weed control on average is much better than a tilled system, than what we're able to get organically here. So our yield is much better because of that weed control issue. So it hands down everything about the system is great, except for this coastal plain issue where we're on a deep sand, where we have moisture concerns, and for the lodging issue, which I have not been able to solve yet. So, well, so if you're content, you know, it just depends on your attitude. I have one grower through 20 acres this last year. And he said, yeah, I'm slower in the field. His whole 20 acres fell over. And he said, yeah, I was slow in the field, but it's slow in the field if I got a lot of weeds up there, too. And I didn't have the weeds to worry about for the combine. I just had to, to go slow to be able to pick it up. It's a, if you look at our plots, I don't know if you've ever seen our picture, it almost bends over. It's a funny-looking lodging as well. It sort of curves down, and the top part of the plant is often touching the ground, and the whole middle is sticking up. All right, thank you all very much. I want to stand between us and break. And thank you all, our virtual audience, for attending today. Um, as I have mentioned in the chat pod, um, this uh, webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website at 